Let's talk about the Bush Doctrine and the Greater Middle East, the Ukraine crisis and U.S.-Russia relations. I've talked a bit about that. And then the failure of engagement with China. These are the three most glaring examples of failure. The Bush Doctrine. The Bush Doctrine was designed to turn the Middle East into a sea of democracies in keeping with um, liberal hegemony. Uh, it's very important to understand that the war in Iraq, 2003, was not going to be, in the minds of the liberal hegemonists, the last war in the Middle East. It was the first stop on the train line, the second stop on the train line, if you want to include Afghanistan. We didn't go much further in terms of invading other countries because Iraq turned into a fiasco. But the idea was that we could use military force or the threat of military force, the threat of military force, to overthrow governments in the region and install liberal democracies in their place and therefore produce peace in the Middle East that solved the proliferation and terrorism problems. I know this sounds crazy now, but this is the way we were thinking. You remember Afghanistan is finally under American control by December 2001, and then in early 2002, the Americans are talking about maybe invading Iraq. The Israelis catch wind of the fact that we're going to do Iraq, and the Israelis send a high-level delegation to Washington to say, why are you doing Iraq? You should be doing Iran. It's the greater threat. The Americans say, don't worry. Iraq is the low-hanging fruit. We're going to go in and do Iraq. And then when we're done with Iraq, we'll either do Syria or Iran next. But we won't have to do one or two more of these military invasions before everybody in the region understands how powerful we are and throws up their hand and jumps on the American bandwagon. The Israelis foolishly believe the Americans, thinking that we have found the magic formula for winning wars, and they then begin to champion an invasion of Iraq. What's the result? Total disaster. It's truly amazing the amount of murder and mayhem that the United States is responsible for in the Middle East. Truly amazing. Virtually no successes and nothing but failures. And failures where huge numbers of people die. Countries are physically wrecked. Afghanistan, now the longest war in American history. I know not a single national security analyst who thinks there's any possibility we can win that war. And all we're doing is kicking the can down the road now so that Obama doesn't get blamed for losing Afghanistan, and now Trump doesn't get blamed for losing Afghanistan. Iraq, we wrecked that country. Syria, where the United States has played a, a very important role in trying to topple Assad that's hardly ever repeat, reported in, in the media. That's a total disaster. The amount of murder and mayhem we've created in Syria. And oh, Libya, we did a great job there, right? With the help of the Europeans. My God, right? The Bush Doctrine in the Greater Middle East, an abject failure. Then there's the Ukraine crisis and US-Russia relations. I've talked a little bit about this. You know in the West, here in Europe, and certainly in the United States, we blame the Russians for the crisis. Well. I don't buy this argument for one second. From the time we started talking about NATO expansion, the Russians made it very clear that it was unacceptable to them. They were too weak to stop it in 1999. That's when the first tranche took place. They were too, stop, too weak to stop it in 2004, which is when the second tranche of expansion took place. But after 2008, when we were talking about doing Georgia, and talking about doing Ukraine, they said, this is not going to happen. It was in April 2008 at the Bucharest summit, the Bucharest NATO summit, April 2008, where when the meeting was over with, a declaration was issued by NATO that said Georgia and Ukraine would become part of NATO. The Russians went ballistic. It's no accident, ladies and gentlemen, that a couple months later, in August 2008, you had a war over Georgia. Georgia-Russia War, August 2008, Bucharest Summit, April 2008, and then on February 22nd, 2014, you had a major crisis break out over Ukraine. The Russians had no intention 
of letting either Georgia or Ukraine become a Western bulwark on their doorstep. And the end result is that neither one of those countries has become a Western bulwark, and the Russians are going to great lengths to wreck those countries. And the Russians are now going to great lengths to split NATO apart and split the EU apart so that they can expand further eastward. And furthermore, we have terrible relations between Russia and Western Europe, between Russia and the United States. And from an American point of view, we have foolishly driven the Russians into the arms of the Chinese which is not in our interest. Uh, and the people who are s suffering the most from this are the Ukrainians, because the Russians are interested in wrecking that country, and we're not going to do anything to defend the Russians, we meaning the United States and the Europeans. That's failure number two. Failure number three is engagement with China. It's clear in the 1990s that China is on the rise. So the question is, what do you do? The basic view of the liberal hegemonists is that you engage with China, right? And what does engagement mean? You get China deeply integrated into the open international economy. You get China deeply embedded in international institutions. And as it becomes richer and richer, it will become a liberal democracy. I mean, this is the story we tell ourselves in the West. It will become a liberal democracy. And of course, once it becomes a liberal democracy, to put it in Robert Zellick's terms, it will become a responsible stakeholder in the international system. So actually, the United States doesn't think like a realist would and say, geez, I'm not sure that I want to turn China into Godzilla, or that maybe I want to contain China. No, 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 no. We decide we're going to help China grow more and more powerful Right? Because it will eventually then become a democracy. It'll look like us, and since we're the good guys, and they will then be the good guys, and the planet is populated by nothing but good guys, we all live happily ever after. That's the story. It didn't work out that way. <laughs> Just ask Xi Jinping. It didn't work out that way. And actually, all the architects of this strategy, right? all the architects of this strategy, uh, now admit that it was a failure. Right? I just want to say one other thing about realists. Realists like me, I was a prominent public opponent of the Iraq war and all these crazy wars we fought. As I often joke to people, I've become a peacenik in the United States. It's hard to believe Mr. Realism 101 is a peacenik. The Ukraine crisis, you just heard my argument. I was opposed to NATO expansion from the get-go. I was one of those people who said this is going to lead to big trouble. George Kennan, of course, famously made that argument. And lo and behold, that's what happened. And with regard to engaging China and turning it into Godzilla, I would have never done that since we had no way of knowing what China's intentions would be. Uh, but anyway, this is liberal hegemony at work. OK, why did it fail? I've told you what the argument here. First of all, power of nationalism, power of realism, and overselling individual rights. Power of nationalism. Look, the idea that the United States can go around the world violating the sovereignty of other countries, invading those countries, and doing social engineering at the end of a rifle barrel is a prescription for giant trouble. If you're smart, you stay out of countries like Iraq. You stay out of countries like Afghanistan. When I was young, right, I was in the American military. I was in the American military from 1965 to 1975, which was coterminous with the Vietnam War. And over the course of those 10 years, I watched the United States get battered in Vietnam and lose. We lost the Vietnam War. It was a deeply humbling experience for the American people. And the thing I learned was you do not want to go into a place like Vietnam. It's a prescription for real trouble. The French were there before us. Remember, the French were defeated at the NBN Phu in 1954. De Gaulle told us in 1964 and 1965, don't go in there. We've been there, done that. It did not turn out well. It's not going to turn out well for you. It did not turn out well for us. And then I remember in 1979, the Chinese foolishly invaded North Vietnam, or it was then Vietnam, but the northern part of Vietnam, and they got their snouts whacked. In 1979, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. 
Most of my colleagues, if not all my colleagues in the national security community were aghast. Soviets are on the march. This is the end of the world. We have to double the defense budget. We have to do this. We have to do that. I said, you're dead wrong. They just jumped into a giant quagmire. If you're arms racing with the Soviet Union, what you want them to do is try and invade a country like Afghanistan. You saw what happened to us. We're still there 14 years later. Or 14 years later, 18 years later, right? It's the longest war in American history. Stay out of these places. People in countries like Iraq, countries like Afghanistan, and other countries around the world do not want the United States invading them and telling them how to do their politics. And what happens is we become an occupier, and that leads to an insurgency, and it is one giant mess. So you want to stay out. The point is you get resistance. And by the way, the power of nationalism also applies to the Russians and the Chinese. You know that the United States is interested in foisting liberal democracy on Moscow and on Beijing. There's no question about that. You go to Moscow and you go to Beijing and you talk to the foreign policy elites about how they think about it. They think about it the same way we think about the Russians interfering in our domestic politics. Surprise, surprise, as my mother taught me when I was a little boy. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. No? So, if we don't like the Russians interfering in our politics, don't be surprised if they don't like us interfering in their politics. And the same thing goes with the Chinese. 